Good evening. Thank you for joining us for part one of Demystifying Dementia, a two-part series. My name is Phoebe James and I'm a Professional Development Officer with the Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. Before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we are all meeting on today. I come to you from beautiful Awapiku country and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Just wanted to mention before we start that this session is being recorded. The recording and the PDF slides will become available on the PHN website under the education library within the next week or so. Um, if we have time at the end, there will be a Q&A session. Please feel free to put your questions in the question box. Um, you'll also be emailed an evaluation at the end of this. Um, please make sure you fill it out because we love feedback. I will now hand over to Dr. Stephanie Gatt-Dale, a um, Dementia Training Australia GP clinical educator. Hello and good evening, welcome. So um, I'm Stephanie Daly and I'm a GP in Adelaide and I'm sitting on Ghana land. And tonight we have with us Pete um, Silverberg. Who, Pete, do you want to introduce yourself and say where you are? Yeah, thanks Steph, hi everyone. So, I'm sitting in Suffolk Park, which is just out of Byron Bay on Bundjalung Nation of the Arakwal uh, people. And um, I work as a GP in Lennox Head, which is a small coastal town. Some of you may know it um, just down the road from here. And also as the lead, lead clinician with Rekilling the Spirit, which is an Aboriginal medical service in Lismore. And next to him, we've also got Rebecca Moore. So Rebecca, do you want to tell us where you are? what you do yeah um yeah so my name's rebecca moore and i work um in newcastle i work at, at redhead surgery um and i have a special interest in dementia um, i'm doing a master's at the moment in dementia at the university of tasmania okay and so tonight we're going to be delivering the first in a two-part um series of a workshop which is going to demystify dementia for you um, and so we're going to be taking you through the first part of that tonight which is looking at identifying and making the diagnosis in primary care and the second session which is in a couple of weeks time we'll be looking at instituting management and post-diagnostic support for people living with dementia so if we can move on to the next slide There are a lot of people who have been involved in this workshop over the years. It's been running for about 10 years. And um, these are the acknowledgements of the people that were involved in producing this webinar. It's normally done as a workshop face to face, but we've converted it to webinar to reach more people. And if you move on to the next slide, please, Phoebe. So we do have some um, learning outcomes tonight. and. Broadly, we're going to introduce you to you some frameworks that will help with your clinical practice so that you can use these to feel more confident about making a diagnosis or identifying people with cognitive decline in primary care. We're also going to talk a little bit about the health pathways that you have access to, which should also support some of the work that we're talking about in this workshop. Um, so if we move on to the next slide. We like to always have some take home messages because if you can remember these three things at the end of tonight, then we'll have done our job well. Um, the first is that dementia is more than a memory problem. So um, that's the first take home message. The second one is that the cognitive assessment tools are not diagnostic tests. And the third one, which we'll probably talk about a little bit more in the second session, is that in many situations, we certainly believe that a person's GP is um, able to diagnose and initiate post-diagnostic care for people living with dementia in many situations. So I think in the next slide we're going to talk about a trigger warning and Beck, I think you're going to just run us through why we have a trigger warning. Yeah we put this slide in because um, we do know that for some people it can be quite a sensitive topic. Um, many of us have in some way or another had um, personal experiences of people living with dementia and people who may have died um, as a result of their dementia and we certainly acknowledge that this can be a, a, a sensitive area um, and that those feelings are completely valid and if 
if you ever did want to talk about them further, then we can certainly um, be contacted through dementia training. If you move on to the next slide, along with the sensitive subject of triggers, we also have language. And why do we talk about language, Beck? Um, well, I mean, there are there are several reasons of this, and it just occurred to me. I've had a few people tell me um, how much of a change there has been. They walk into a consultation as Pamela, and they may come out of a consultation as Pamela who has dementia. And I think it's really important that as health professionals, we're quite cognizant of just those slight changes in perception in the way, the way that having a, a diagnosis of dementia might uh, affect how somebody perceives themselves and certainly the way in which they may be perceived themselves. And in fact, they've gone in as one person and come out as exactly the same person. And I think um, the way that we consult um, is important, making sure that um, we're directing our conversation to the person living with dementia, to, to the patient, um, rather than necessarily focusing on, on the um, person that they've come in with. Um, and even as um, the, the condition progresses to involve um, the person constantly. And that's where language is really important. So there are a series of guidelines that have been um, prepared. Uh, Dementia Australia has some, uh, you can see in the bottom section there, um, uh, that you can click on to have a look at the language guidelines. But essentially these are guidelines to try and empower and reduce the stigma associated with dementia. So here at Dementia Training Australia, we try um, hard to make sure that we refer to people who have a diagnosis of dementia as people living with dementia, not a person with dementia, and certainly not a dementing person, um, because I think just subtle things like that can really have a big impact on the way they perceive themselves and others perceive them. And similarly with behaviour, I think, um, you know, we, we've all probably been there um, talking about a difficult patient or a challenging person. And I think um, we're certainly encouraging people to discuss these as changed behaviours and expressions of unmet needs um, and particularly stipulating what the behaviours are. Um, Yes. Yeah. So it's less about describing the person as the behaviour or as the disease and more about reflecting that the person has a behaviour as a result of their disease or they have some a symptom as yeah, a result okay. of their disease. Um, so, yes, yes, and maintaining their personhood. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Because you can become, you can become, you can just by the nature of having a diagnosis somehow feel less of an individual person and so it's up to us mm. as the clinical professional around those people to maintain that person's individuality by using the correct language it's also just yeah. polite um all right so um so we're going to do a little exercise now where we're going to have a think about why why we're talking about dementia tonight really so if we move on to the next slide we're going to use um, the metaphor of the Price is Right game. So the Price is Right game was back in the 80s, um, a ranking game where you had to rank a list of prizes. And if you got them all in the right order, you won the prizes. And we're going to talk uh, using this as a metaphor to talk around some of the issues that we find around making the diagnosis and supporting people with that diagnosis with regards to dementia. So I'm going to move on to the next this slide. Is Pens were four hundred and forty dollars in the nineteen eighties. Huh? So I said it's good to see that pens were four hundred and forty dollars in the nineteen eighties. <laughs> on that list, I just noticed <laughs> that <laughs> inflation hasn't hit everything. Pens have gone down. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the the first list of what we've got here is a list of conditions, and this list of conditions are just in alphabetical order, and there's ten conditions listed there. Um, and what I want you to have a think about at home uh, or wherever you are is if you look at these conditions, which one of those would you find that easiest to diagnose? And whilst you're having a think about that, I'm going to get Beck to have a 
verbal think about that and outline her thoughts about how she approaches this list and what the easiest condition to diagnose is. Um, I think that it's always good to have a fairly clear test that you can do to make a diagnosis. So, um, I mean, looking through the list, I would say something like diabetes should be relatively easy to diagnose given that it's a there's a cutoff level in investigations that um, uh, that will give you a diagnosis essentially. Other things such as bowel and breast cancer are, are quite obvious um, for the same reasons really. Yeah and usually people, um, well certainly for sometimes with breast cancer it's identified during routine screening for a mammogram or or perhaps self-presenting with a, an obvious symptom. All right so um, if we move on to the next slide. Pete, which of these would you say is the hardest? So this is the same, exactly the same list, and now I want you to think about what's the hardest condition to diagnose and why? And um, again, have a think in your own mind. Um, and um, oh, someone says they can't hear me. Does that mean you can't hear me or can't hear anyone? Hopefully you can. I can definitely hear you, Steph. Good. This is Sandra. Um, so, um, Pete, what do you think is the hardest condition? to diagnose? Uh, it's a similar sort of answer to the first one, something that doesn't have clear guidelines, um, an easy to order and interpret test, um, something that um, I can't do myself, like I can't take a tissue biopsy from the bowel, potentially from the breast as well. So th th all those things where there's clear, clear frameworks and clear diagnostic tests that I can do in my own general practice, I find the most challenging. And then the yeah. other ones would be things that are perhaps um, can present in multiple different ways. So, um, uh, you know, heart failure generally presents as shortness of breath, but it can present as fatigue too. So that makes it a little bit more challenging. You have to think sometimes a bit outside the box. Yeah, that's right. So where the symptoms perhaps cross over, like heart failure could be presenting as um, perhaps sometimes COPD and the over, you know, there's overlap, isn't there? So it can be difficult. And of course, dementia. Um, does fit that category as well because it's um, a, you know a disease with an insidious onset often something that um, is associated with stigma and so people are less likely to self-present as a result of that um, and again there isn't um, a single unified test that we can do in primary care or, or anyone can do really at the moment that will definitely identify somebody as having um, dementia. All right, so if we move on to the next slide, now we're going to think about how do we how do we manage some of these conditions. So which of these conditions would you say, Beck, is the easiest to manage? Well, again, things that there are fairly clear guidelines for, so things such as diabetes, influenza and pneumonia, um, and even um, some of the uh, breast and bowel cancer, you know, there's a fairly clear pathway as to how we're going to approach things. Um, yeah, it's, it's the same. It's the same kind of idea, really. Yeah. So things that get better on their own um, are always easier to manage. Okay. So if we move on to the next slide, this is things that are harder to manage. So Pete, what do you find difficult to manage on this list, and why? Um, I think things that are harder to manage. Well, there's the obvious things like the cancers that the specialists are managing so I'm not really managing them but for myself in general practice uh, they're the things that really affect uh, multiple parts of a person so I mean I always think about any um, problem or disease process in a person from a whole person perspective but there are some illnesses that really cross over in so many different parts of that person's well-being and makeup um, that do make them more challenging so I mean, depression is not on that list, but that would be obviously one that people know about. And then, of course, dementia is the one that we're going to talk about tonight, that we're going to um, give you a framework that demonstrates to you how it really is a very sort of global um, whole person illness. Mm. And also, I think there's a sort of perception that <clears throat> because there's not any curative treatment, that um, that makes it also difficult to manage, whereas some of the other things like, for example, diabetes, whilst it's not curative, there are some very good guidelines and medications that we can um, use in a stepwise approach. And we always feel, I guess, as clinicians, sometimes 
more comfortable with um, things that can be managed in a medical or pharmaceutical way, I guess. Um, whereas dementia, actually, some of the tools that we use in primary care all the time can be totally applicable, but we just perhaps haven't thought about it in that way before. Yeah, so, that is true. I'll just, I'll just quickly yeah, add there. Like, I, yeah, you know, I think like diabetes um, is uh, becoming a lot, as a practitioner, you know, we've got so many great, well, we've got, you know, two new classes of diabetic medications that are really making a big difference in people's lives that I'm sure everyone um, is, you know, appreciating currently. And um, while um, people on this webinar probably already know that we don't have similar medications in dementia, um, we do want to leave you with a feeling of hope that um, the research is suggesting and there's definitely, you know, the specialists in this area are hopeful that we're, we're probably sort of 10, 15 years ago where we were in some of these other illnesses like diabetes and some of the new cancer treatments around immunotherapy. So there is definitely hope on the horizon. Yeah. All right. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, so actually, this list is not just any random list. Um, it is a list of the top 10 leading causes of death in Australia in women. Um, and if we were able to see you, we would get you to um, answer, you know, which one do you think is the, the leading cause? But I'll tell you what most people say, because we do this quite a lot. Most people feel that it's somewhere between cardiovascular, so ischemic heart disease, um, breast cancer, and sometimes cerebral vascular disease. That's kind of the pattern. Um, but actually, if the leading cause of death for women in Australia at the moment is actually dementia. So if we go on to the next slide, um, I don't think they're, the, this is the order. So as you can see, dementia is number one, ischemic heart disease is number two. And if you look at the whole population, men and women, um, dementia and ischemic heart disease rotate so mostly it's dementia sometimes it's ischemic heart disease and in men ischemic heart disease is number one and dementia is number two um so we have a condition that we all find a little bit challenging to diagnose we feel not so confident in managing people living with dementia yet it's the leading cause of death um in Australia for, for half of the population. And so I think that really goes to why we're talking about it tonight, um, because we really want to improve the level of confidence and, um, and you know, skill in the community so that we can actually be better prepared for looking after the number of people who have dementia. And at the moment, with an elderly population that's set to increase, the numbers are also set to increase. So it's about 400,000 people estimated to be living with dementia in Australia right now, but that's set to double by 2050. Um, and so um, it's only going to increase in, in, in the magnitude in terms of how we're supporting people in primary care. So with that in mind, we'll move on to the next slide which, um, yeah, it's just highlighting some of the impacts of dementia. And I think, as we've already said, it's the leading cause of death. But earlier on this year, the AHIW also released some data to show it's the leading cause of disability in the over 65s. And for women, um, women tend to be more affected than men, probably twice as often. Um, but it's not Sure, we're not clear, clear exactly what the reason for that is. Some people feel it's because um, women are living longer than men, but there seems to be some other reasons behind that. Um, we also know that women tend to have um, a faster trajectory than men and that women do most of the care. So it's important to think about it in terms of not just around gender, but just around the people that we're seeing day to day in primary care who might be more likely to be at risk of developing dementia and how do we go about identifying those people in primary care as well in terms of case finding and supporting the people around those people living with dementia all right so if we go on to the next slide this webinar or well, workshop was invest was um part of some research in 2017 where it looked at how how confident practitioners felt. So they looked at supervisors and registrars and they found that both supervisors and registrars did lack confidence in making the diagnosis of dementia. And they found that 
the more senior um, supervisors had more experiential knowledge, so had more confidence because they've been doing it for longer, but their basis, base level of knowledge was, was not that great, about the same as the registrars. And, and this shows that you know, in medical schools and postgraduate training, dementia really hasn't been on the curriculum in a big way. I think that's changing now, and hopefully we'll all become more and more confident as time goes on, but it is um, a competitive space, the education world. So I guess this slide is just to show you that everybody who completes this webinar or workshop actually does go away feeling a bit more confident about what they're doing and hopefully can use those tools in primary care. All right, taking so I'm gonna stop. Taking the blindfold off, Steph. Taking the blindfold off, that's right, yes. One by one. Um, so I'm gonna stop talking now. <laughs> I'm gonna get um, Pete to talk about defining, how do we define dementia? What's our definition? Um, yeah, I was looking at this slide earlier and thinking, geez, there's so many different ways you could you could make a definition of dementia, but the 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 consensus when you look up things, you know, in the literature is that um, um, looking at sort of like a pathological and clinical uh, definition is that it's progressive, so it gets worse over time. That's a really important point that we're going to ram home tonight. That it's global, so it affects many different parts of the brain and it affects many different parts of the person. Being a, an illness of the brain, obviously it's going to affect um, you know, lots of different parts of the way you live. And like Steph was just saying, it's a life limiting condition um, that involves uh, brain degeneration um, and in Alzheimer's disease, um, uh, which we're going to be talking about tonight, um, that has a specific type of, of pathology that we think is going on and it affects people in different ways and has many different forms. So, and it's, you know, that's pretty obvious because everyone's different, aren't they? So um, everyone, uh, you know, so a common feature of dementia is memory loss and how that memory loss may affect me or how it may affect Steph or Beck is going to be different. And so it's going to affect the patients that rock up into your room differently as well. And there are many different types of dementia and we're going to, there's a slide coming up that's going to go through that in a little bit now. Any so how do people always ask, don't they, Pete, how do people die from dementia and why do we, why, how is it the leading cause of death? That's a common question that we get asked. And I think that's on the picture on the next slide, but if you'd like to just explain it as well. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, that's right. So when you die from dementia, there's there's um, the way to think about that is that sometimes the brain becomes so um, um, uh, affected by the illness that it just is no longer able to function properly. So, I mean, like, you know, technically, you know, thinking about sort of, I wouldn't use this term necessarily with patients, but, you know, speaking to other doctors, if you think about, you know, organ failure, so, you know, like heart failure and kidney failure. So eventually you end up with essentially what's sort of like a brain failure. And it just can't um, cope with the functions of daily living. So that includes things like swallowing. So you may end up having an aspiration pneumonia. You can't um, talk properly. Your brain may shut down to external stimuli and you not become interested in life anymore and you may stop eating. Um, you may lose your balance and your muscle tone and fall over and break your hip. And that may, you know, be, be a reason for death. Um, and that's that's essentially yeah how it happens. I think we've got the next slide there. Make sure I haven't missed anything. Yeah. Hmm. And um, just talking about you know further a little bit further about why we're talking about this tonight. I think on the next slide, Pete, do you want to outline some of the challenges or some more stuff around expand on what we talked about in terms of you know what's the point of talking about dementia? Yes, yeah, so they used so so for for a long time, um, and this may explain some of our research that people have, you know aren't confident or haven't been taught in this area. Is that there's sort of been this nihilistic approach to dementia in terms of like, why would you talk about it? Why would you tell someone they have dementia when there's no cure and there's nothing you can do? And um, that's really far from the truth. And hopefully by the end of the second webinar, we will have convinced you otherwise. So there's many different reasons why it's important to talk about this and to understand it and to help your patients potentially assist them with a, with a diagnosis and one that's early in the course of the illness. And early means the patient has you know, capacity to understand what's going on still. So they haven't lost full insight 
and judgment. And they still have the ability to make really important decisions that all our patients and ourselves want to make around, um, you know, things that you know about, you know, in terms of like where I'm going to live later. So, you, you know, guardianship um, in terms of where your assets are going to go. So that's your will in terms of, you know, what may happen if I have a big stroke and I can't talk. So that's your, your um, advanced care directive um, and, you know, power of attorney in terms of your legal matters um, and just having a certainty. So, you know, patients are often family or worried when they come and see you and being able to give them some certainty and say, yes, this is um, most likely an Alzheimer's dementia is often a gift to that family and that person because they've got some certainty about what's what's going on in their life. Um, and then the last, the, last, the last thing to say there is that, um, and we don't have time to cover it tonight, but I'm just giving you these tempters, is that in the future we're going to get much, much better at diagnosing dementia earlier and the treatments are going to be given much, much earlier. So um, that's an, an, another important reason to start understanding this illness now. Mm. Great. So, Beth, do you want to talk to us, if you go on to the next slide, a little bit more about what do we mean when we're talking about dementia precisely? Uh, so, as you can see, dementia is considered to be an umbrella term. Dementia is, as Pete described, a progressive neurodegenerative disorder, and there are over a hundred different types of pathology that can cause dementia. So we're going to discuss predominantly Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia because these are the two most common forms of dementia. Um, but as Pete said, depending on what type of pathology there is and where, where the pathology is in the location of the brain, we'll, um, we'll give a different set of symptoms and everybody will present individually. Um, so uh, we will talk predominantly about Alzheimer's and vascular, but I think it's also important because in your careers, you will definitely come across other forms of dementia. You'll definitely see um, uh, dementia, a Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. And almost certainly you'll come across people uh, living with frontotemporal dementia, formerly known as Pick's disease. You might also see alcohol related, head injury related, or even HIV related dementias. Um, and more recently, there's uh, a lot of research into this condition um, called LATE, which is a mimic essentially of Alzheimer's disease, but has a different pathology and is tending to occur in the very old, the oldest old. Um, and I think we'll we'll hear a lot more about that in the in the next ten years or so. So uh, a brief word on Lewy body dementia. Um, this tends to occur in a slightly younger population, as sort of more in the seventies. Um, people will often display uh, changes in their sleep, so a REM sleep behaviour disorder. So acting out their dreams, thrashing, violent shouting. Um, people uh, with this form of dementia might experience um, quite a fluctuation over the course of the day. So sometimes they're doing very well and sometimes um, the dementia seems a lot more prominent. And similarly, they can experience sort of excessive daytime sleepiness. And um, usually with a dementia with Lewy bodies, you'll develop the dementia first and then usually after um, the diagnosis is that later after a you know that later you might develop um uh, parkinson's type movements whereas a parkinson's dementia you begin with a parkinson's disease and the dementia tends to occur um sort of a year after that um, or more uh the other thing to note is visual hallucinations can be very common and can be um very specific often of children and animals um, and people with these forms of dementia might um, have an increased sensitivity to antipsychotics. I think that covers everything we were going to talk about. Does that sound right, Steph? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, it's just, in, yeah, so it's just important to have that in the back of your mind that some people might have a diagnosis of Lewy body. And quite often, uh, people 
get reclassified so they might get one diagnosis and then they go and see someone and they get another diagnosis and also quite a lot of these pathologies overlap so some people will have yes. Alzheimer's disease a bit of vascular and they may also have a bit of Lewy body disease for us it doesn't really matter too much we just need to know that that's a possibility and so if somebody say you did treat their um, psychotic symptoms or their hallucinations with an antipsychotic and they it exacerbated their Parkinsonian symptoms then kind of you've answered your question as to whether there's some Lewy body disease there and you probably wouldn't use mm. that medication again for that person um, but for the purposes yeah. of tonight we're just focusing on Alzheimer's disease and vascular because that's by far the most common um, accounting for you know up to sort of 80 percent of presentations really and so really that's what we're going to see most often in primary care and some of the other ones you'll see them but they'll they'll be the ones that you're less likely to make the diagnosis yourself in and more likely to refer to other people um, for support um, but I certainly have got about three or four people with frontotemporal dementia in my general practice um, who see me um, as well as uh, people from all of those different collections of diseases. All right, so we'll move on to the next slide, which is to talk about how do we make a difference or the distinction between what is normal aging and what is dementia. And we are going to talk much more in detail about how you actually make a diagnosis of dementia. So for now, put that to one side of your head, and we're just going to talk about what's normal. Um, so for most people, as we get older, our brains are a bit like a computer and they start slowing down actually from quite midlife. Um, and so it's normal to have some memory lapses. So it's normal. I would consider myself midlife. It's normal that I um, forget sometimes people's names, people that I know well, or it's normal that I sometimes lose my keys. Um, but it's not something that's happening for me repeatedly and increasing in increasing frequency and probably most people who are busy mums and work um, of my age are also having the same problems and so it's in keeping with my peers um, so I'm aware of it and I'm aware that it's worse a little bit when I'm tired or when I'm a bit stressed or when I've got a lot going on but I but it doesn't seem to be getting worse okay so that is normal aging and, I, and it's not impairing my ability to function. So I'm getting up and I'm going to work and just about managing to do everything else that I need to do in the day, despite being very busy. Um, so that's what normal aging is, okay? But the next slide talks about mild cognitive impairment, okay? Now this is not normal aging. It's estimated that there's about 800,000 people with mild cognitive impairment in Australia. Um, and what that means is we've got there it's significant memory loss compared with peers. It can actually be other cognitive functions that are also affected. But for now, we'll just use memory. I'll use memory in a case just to briefly explain it. So um, this is where your memory is more impaired than someone else of a similar age. So a couple of weeks ago in my clinic, I saw a lady who's in her late 60s and um, she's quite an intelligent, very highly intelligent, trained as a nurse. Um, her actual her twin identical twin sister has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's so she was worried about her memory because of that now she is having symptoms of very significant memory impairment so um, she can't remember the details of conversations from the week before when she's met up with people for coffee she's having some difficulty with remembering um, TV programs week to week. So if she binge watches a show, she can she knows what's happening throughout the show. Um, but if she's watching a show that she watched last week, she can't remember the detail of it when she's watching the next episode. And so for somebody who's in their late 60s, that's not normal for age. If you ask 10 people in their 60s whether they could remember a conversation that they had with people for having coffee last week, they would probably be able to remember and they probably would be able to watch a TV show and remember the episode um, but it's not impairing her function so day to day she's able to get herself washed dressed make her cooking she's driving she's doing all of her normal functions and it's not impairing her ability to function um, and when I did a cognitive assessment screen on her or did the use the cognitive assessment tool the things that she failed to get the points for were memory um, and so 
I know that she's got mild cognitive impairment. Now, what the cause of her mild cognitive impairment is needs to be investigated. And we'll talk you through, you will use the same principles that you use for making a diagnosis of dementia to investigate somebody with mild cognitive impairment. So I won't go into that in detail, but when we talk about it, this is the same approach. So it's the same approach for anybody that you see with, even if they have subjective memory concerns, you would still try to assess whether or not there is any underlying cause um, before attributing it to something like Alzheimer's disease. Um, but we do know that these people who have mild cognitive impairment have a high risk of developing dementia, higher than the background population. And on average, 10 to 15 percent of those people will go on to develop dementia each and every year. And so we need to start being aware of these people in primary care so that we can follow them up probably on an annual basis to see if they are the individuals who are progressing um, and starting to have impairment in their functional day to day activities. So Beck and Pete, do you think that explains it or would you add anything else to my explanation? Because it is quite a, I think it's quite a difficult concept to get across, um, particularly before we've kind of gone into the diagnostics of how to make a diagnosis of dementia. I think I think that's a really good summary, Steph, except I sometimes forget what happened in the week show last week. In my <laughs> <laughs> That's why they have the catch up, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, I think, you know, the way, the thing that sort of the penny drop moment for me was thinking about that there's a proportion of people with mild cognitive impairment who are in fact what we believe to be a prodromal phase of Alzheimer's disease. So in other words, we're picking up the disease earlier and earlier. So like, it's a bit like where the A1C is between six and six and a half in diabetes. And, um, and uh, so, and 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 because mostly Alzheimer's begins in the hippocampus, which is where the memory is laid down, that's where we're starting to see when we do amyloid scans. That's where we're seeing the amyloid build up too. So, um, and uh, I mean, you've got a little blood, a little blood sort of uh, uh, test tube on the top of the screen. There. I'm not sure if that was supposed to um, trigger a conversation there, but. You know, um, there's a lot of research going into trying to find a blood test and potentially with uh, an imaging scan. And this is still research area, but um, the aim is to try and work out when someone presents like the patient that Steph just described, to be able to do a blood test and maybe an imaging scan and be able to work out whether they are the prodromal Alzheimer's disease or there's something else going on with that patient. Hmm. So that, that, that helped me to understand it. And because, yeah, and that is because um, there is a proportion of people who have mild cognitive impairment who will potentially revert um, or certainly stay stable. So I think now that there are potentially some medications on the horizon, there's a much bigger push for us as GPs to be able to recognise mild cognitive impairment early. And as Pete says, hopefully, in the future, be able to pick out those who have the pre, um, the preclinical or prodromal um, Alzheimer's disease, in order for potentially them to be the ones to to have a consideration for medication. And I yeah. guess the only other thing to say is, um, when we get to management and sort of post-diagnostic support, it's even more important that the people with mild cognitive impairment actually start some of the non-pharmacological things that can um, reduce the impact of their um, symptoms and actually pro pro hopefully um, push out the time to which they may or may not develop dementia that, you know, mm -hmm. and maintain their independence for longer. So rather than letting these people be kind of at sea, not knowing if this is normal aging or not, or is my memory just getting worse? Why is it getting worse? Actually being a bit more proactive and then treating that like, um, like we do cardiovascular risk, um, treating this like brain risk. This is a marker that your brain is, something is going on in your brain and how do we mitigate that risk and, and reduce the impact of that? Um, so that's the other reason, I guess. All right, so now we're going to leave behind these kind of nebulous terms and move on to the nitty gritty of um, making a diagnosis. So if we move on to the next slide, Pete, 
these, this is our first framework. Can you run us through how you use, I think it'd be useful for you to say exactly how you use these, these domains of dementia in your practice. Yeah, no worries, Steph. And um, we do have a resource that we intend to um, to send out to the people on tonight that has um, this slide with some extra bits of writing that will summarise what I'm about to tell you now. So I remember we talked about um, dementia being a global illness that affects people holistically. It's a really whole person um, illness we're describing here. And I mean, there are so many illnesses where you could write down those five domains and I think that would be good when you think about any illness to think about how they're affecting those parts of a person's life. So specifically, um, I've learnt this concept um, with Alzheimer's dementia and it's very helpful. And I think, you know, I have this um, saved as a, as a shortcut um, on my desktop and, you know, if a patient comes into my room and says, I'm worried about my memory or, or the, the, the family member comes in saying worried about the, you know, partners or you know, parents' memory or whoever it is, um, this is a really good place to start and take a history because it really starts to cover off some of the key elements in terms of making a diagnosis and, start, and thinking about your exclusion criteria. So that's the way I think about it. So briefly, the first one is cognition. So we talked about that uh, being memory. So remember we said it had to be progressive. So it also has to be gradual in onset. So we're not talking about someone who's had a stroke one day and the next day, they, you know, next minute, they've suddenly dysphasic and, and, and memory loss. It's a slow onset that takes months to years in Alzheimer's disease, which is what we're now talking about here. And um, but there are other parts of cognition. So the other take home message tonight was that um, uh, Alzheimer's dementia is not just about short term memory loss. And so as you would know, it affects things like attention and concentration, judgment and insight, particularly things around um, everyday um, activities like driving, um, safety around the home, you know, and the um, in, the, in the later stages of the illness, um, that, um, that those things can be affected. And then as your cognition becomes affected, your function also becomes affected, usually pretty much at the same time. And so you have to ask people about um, what has changed over time. And it's really important that you're asking a care or a family member because if the person with possibly with dementia in front of you has memory loss as part of the illness, then obviously their history to you is not going to be as potentially as accurate as someone, um, you know, a carer. So you want to you want to obtain this functional decline. So I ask things like, you know, what did you, <clears throat> is there anything you used to do that you don't do anymore? Like hobbies, like do you play, have you stopped playing sport, have you stopped playing bowls, playing golf, um, you know, cooking, cooking, um, other house chores, um, you know, the, the, the details and the complexity of the chores, like the complexity of, like I used to have a dinner party with like 15 people now I only just cook for myself. Um, and, you know, banking is another one, like how do you go with online banking? Do you remember your PIN number? Those are the sort of questions I ask. And of course, there's all sorts of reasons why people may have a functional decline that you'll have to exclude that isn't Alzheimer's, but in that, if you do want to make that diagnosis, you need to see the functional decline as well. So the next next one's psychiatric. So um, it could be um, the common things you see in general practice. Um, as part of the Alzheimer's dementia, you can have a de de depression and an anxiety as part of the illness, or it could be sometimes reactive to the concept of being sick, uh, of being unwell. Um, you can also have, and uh, Beck talked about this a bit earlier, you can have delusions, um, which is not, um, uh, you know, that uncommon. And they tend to particularly be around sort of paranoia around money and infidelity. So that they tend to be the patterns you might see. And it's worth um, inquiring about and, and, and warning um, family about too. Uh, behavioural change um, can, can be obviously fairly broad in terms of how that presents. But the sort of things you'd be asking about would be, Things like how, how, how's your temper, how's your ability to cope with um, with change. You know, is mum or dad getting a bit short tempered? Are they snapping at you? Um, and often people, especially in the early phase of the disease, they know it's happening, and but they just can't help it. It's like, you know, um, um, you know, if the part of their brain that controls um, inhibition has been affected, then they often snap and they yell or say something they they regret, and then afterwards they feel terribly remorseful about it. Um, and then another one, so that's one, so that's sort of like an outward one. And then the other one would be sort of an inward one. So becoming withdrawn, 
um, and not being interested in life that's going on around you. Um, and so that can also affect you, as you, you know, wanting to socialise and, and, and get out of the house and do those kind of things. Um, and then, you know, there's other ones that you probably um, asked about already with your patients, things like, um, you know, safety around the house and um, walking out of the house and getting lost or driving and forgetting where the car is and these kind of things. And then the last one is physical decline. And so this is often late, later stage of the illness. And um, I briefly touched this before about, you know, about how people die with this illness. And, um, but, um, and, and also it obviously depends on, you know, what, what their background comorbid function is. So um, the physical decline of someone with an Alzheimer's dementia will probably look a bit different to someone where the diagnosis is at 85 or 90, as opposed to someone with a diagnosis of 60 or 65. So, um, but um, you looking at things like, you know, your, your mobility and your balance and your falls risk are really important. And the other one would be eating and swallowing and risk of aspiration. Um, so that's, that's a summary for you, Steph. So Perfect. don't, don't feel like you need to remember all that because we will send you out a resource with that summarised for you. Yeah, yeah. And also, not all of those are applicable to every person or, or every consultation and it might be that you get some of this information from the person themselves or from their closest relative or, or other people um, and maybe it comes in over time um, because that's quite a lot of information um, that, that you can get to try and get in, in a general practice consultation um, but it gives you a sense of why it's such a global how it is a global thing yeah yeah I certainly wouldn't be doing that in 15 minutes so, um, you know, we'll get skilled at the uh, long consultation that rocks up with a 15 minute appointment. <laughs> so it often involves, you know, rebooking and longer consultations for sure. And some of that functional stuff might be picked up in, for, for example, over 75s assessment, health assessment or something like that as well. All right, so the next framework we've got is the stages framework and Beck, you're gonna run us through the stages framework. Okay, so we have three stages, stage one, two, and three. Um, and so the idea of this is essentially um, sort of early through to late um, or mild through to more severe, but um, again, using um, more appropriate language, we're trying to uh, talk about stages one, two, and three. So stage one is when the person living with dementia um, may have some functional change, but is still managing at home. And this is a time where um, family and um, other supports can, can um, come in and start to provide some, uh, some help. So there are practical devices in terms of, you know, Webster packing and calendars and alarms and that sort of thing as reminders that um, uh, you can use starting with a vital call, organising the My Aged Care assessments, et cetera. Um, and at this stage, you may notice that the person um, has had a bit of a change in their outlook, possibly some apathy, a bit less interested in their activities activities of daily living or in their hobbies, just withdrawing a little bit. Um, by stage two, that's where um, there is more of a, perhaps some physical changes starting to occur um, and possibly some of the behavioural changes becoming more prominent as well. And often this is the time when you'll be having a lot of um, consultations with the family who are talking about how, how Hard, it's becoming to look after mum or dad. Um, I know when I was working with the geriatrics team um, in the hospital, often uh, this is the point at which perhaps um, there's a concern about the how safe somebody is to return home. And uh, so things like mobility and continence can often be the point at which perhaps um, residential care is is considered. Um, and then stage three is a more advanced form of dementia where some of those physical changes are now very prominent. Um, so the person has um, declined, um, there's a real loss of 
independence. And so um, people are, are requiring help with their feeding, their dressing, um, often bed bound, um, and their quality of life is certainly diminished. And at this point, we start to look into the palliative um, side of um, care as well. Thank you, Beck. All right, and if we move on to the next slide, this is a pictorial version of those two things. So here we've put the domains of dementia onto a graph um, and along the top axis or the um, um, X axis, you can see the stages of dementia at the top and then the years are represented across time at the bottom. And so you can, I think this is really helpful if you're a, a visual learner, um, but it's also helpful for families to have some concept of trajectory. And that's what the stages can be really useful for um, because highlighting to people some of that patient and, and family education about when, um, when things become more challenging to manage at home and what are those triggers and what should you be thinking about doing at that point is the use of these um, this kind of picture. So if you look at the far left hand side of the graph you can see that stage one which is when we talk about a timely diagnosis, making a diagnosis when people still have the capacity to make decisions and as Pete said all those beneficial things you can do um, are best done if you can make that diagnosis in stage one. We've represented the psychiatric symptoms as a way with a wavy line and that's because they tend to weave in and out like they can be sometimes the presenting symptoms but then they can come and go and it's always important to pay attention to people's um, psychological and mental health throughout the course of their illness um, behaviors are there represented as a kind of wiggly line as well because there's some withdrawal like we said at the beginning and then this peak of distress that occurs in response to really that um, marker of kind of being disorientated or not being able to understand your um, circumstances or be able to communicate what your needs are and so you get this these behaviors that occur in response to perhaps environments or other people. And as you can see on that far right hand side of the graph, all the lines are kind of intersecting um, and coming across each other and it looks really messy. And I, I think that's a metaphor for what it's like in real life as well. Um, people's lives are very difficult um, for both the person concerned and also their family. Um, and navigating that is the biggest challenge with people living with dementia. And I think if we can be there to actually um, support people in the beginning you probably still get to that point where all the lines cross over but you've maybe got some plans in place um, to facilitate moving into residential care or extra home care or whatever the decision is around that the person's decision is around that and enabling them to have some choice in what they're doing um, uh, at that point so that's a handy one to have um, on your desktop uh, at work all right, so we'll move on to the next slide, which um, is again just a picture, which I think we've covered most of these points really, just to recognize that it's both, it's kind of a, it's a public health issue really, dementia. You know, there's there's problems with the community understanding of what dementia is and people thinking that, um, that some of the symptoms associated with dementia are normal aging. And then there's also problems within the, um, the um, health professional and that's health not just GPs that's across the board physios uh, occupational therapists um, secondary care physicians the understanding of what we can do for people living with dementia and how to support people living with dementia is um, lacking so that's what we're all doing here tonight all right so um, the next slide is getting into how do we make the diagnosis so Pete how do we make the diagnosis of dementia what's the most important thing History. <laughs> so, uh, look, dementia is no different to any other um, diagnosis you're making in general practice. Um, history is the most important one. And, you know, by the time you get into your examination, your investigations, it's to sort of kind of exclude or rule in stuff um, and support your diagnosis. So, um, most of it is made on, on the history you're getting from, from um, the patient, but most importantly, from the carers family or other carers or whoever that person may be. So if we move on to the next slide, we're going to look at our second to last framework, which is the inclusion criteria. And Pete, you're going to run us through what you've already said some of this. So just highlighting yeah. why this is important. Yeah, no worries. I'm not going to get you guys to help me in a second do this too. So um, 
uh, so yep, this is this is the next framework. So this is the four inclusion criteria. So you want to be able to tick off these boxes um, to uh, be able to make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And then the next um, slides will be the exclusion criteria. So just a sneak preview that that's coming up. We won't go there just yet. So with the inclusion criteria, we talked about this as the gradual progressive onset of poor memory, which is worsening over time, progressive. And remember I talked about function. You need to prove that there's a change in function. So there's there's a three already. So I don't, I don't think we need to go over that again. I think you guys have sort of nailed that. Now the last one is you also want to elicit some sort of um, um, other sort of cortical dysfunction that's not memory. And so the, the three areas that you want to go exploring are in dysphasia, agnosia and dyspraxia. So dysphasia, as you're probably aware, is an impairment in language uh, fluency. So, um, and again, like this is not someone who's had a stroke where, where it can often be quite pronounced. It's often quite subtle and you have to ask for it um, to often um, elicit it. So I'm going to demonstrate this now um, with uh, Steph and Beck. So I'll make um, Steph the, the normal and Beck will be someone as a person living with dementia. So one of my, fa my, my favourite one is um, called Naming Animals and I say to Steph, I say, look, I'm, over the next 60 seconds, I'm going to ask you in a minute to name as many animals as you can that just pop into your head spontaneously. So when I say go, you tell me the animals that pop into your head. Okay, go. Dog, cat, mouse, rabbit, horse, cow, sheep, um, kangaroo, koala, wombat, um, tiger, lion, elephant, zebra. Um, That's right. So, yeah, you can stop now. Yeah, so I don't have to go to a minute. Um, she's already getting sort of 10 to 12, you know, in the first little bit, which is pretty normal. And you can see there that she's quite fluent. There's a little break every now and then, which is normal, but there's, there's still a fluency there. And the other thing you notice is that Steph has grouped the animals, which is also very common. So she went with the pet animals, the, the dogs and the cats and stuff, and then, and then moved to, um, you know, another, I can't remember which ones they were now. I think they were the, um, the, the ones in the jungle, like the lions and the tigers. And then you might move to, you know, another group of animals. So that, that's, 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 that's normal. And now I'm going to uh, pretend Beck is a person living with dementia and I've worded the same um, example and I'll ask her, so Beck, when uh, when you're ready, I'm going to say go and just whatever animals pop into your head, um, just let me know what they are. Okay, go. Yeah. She's frozen. Oh, frozen. <laughs> no, 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 no example. Okay. Steph, I'll use it. Wait till it comes back. Um, cat. Um, um, kookaburra. Oh, have I cut out? Oh, sorry. Yes, <laughs> yeah, so let's, cat. Let's start again. Um, kookaburra. Yep. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry. Right. Okay. Um, animals. Okay. Um, pig. Um, Okay, so in fact, Beck, that yeah. was actually Beck. and the head turning sign too, which is the one. <laughs> so, <laughs> the head turning so sign, I think we've all seen it, but it's where the person will look at the person next to them for for some sort of confirmation. Um, and also, there's often a repetition, isn't there, Pete? That you know they'll say the same animal again, and then ask, "Have I said right. that already?" Well, they might re-ask you the question. <laughs> so. Um, so um, it's kind of like they kind of they know what they need to do, but they just the word is just not coming into their head, you know. So you know, ask the person next door, or just ask me that again. But there's part of their brain that's sort of registering what you've asked, but they just can't can't get the word, and there's no fluency. So so that's um, that's dysphasia. Agnosia you've probably done before, which is um, you know the ability to name a person or object, and that's often part of a cognitive assessment. Um, tool that you might use, like a mini mental state um, um, or a GP cog. So you know, you know what's what's this, and um, you know, try and maybe get more um, complex items like a stethoscope is often useful to do something like that. And then dyspraxia um, is about a disorder of, of motor skills and coordination. And uh, so um, 
there's a few ways to do that. Often what happens when a person has dyspraxia with dementia is they lose the ability to, um, to use a tool. And so functionally, you might have asked them, um, and I didn't talk about this, but you could ask them, you know, how do you go using a remote control on the TV or how do you go using a phone? And they're starting to, you know, oh, so and so always used to do the TV remote control, but now, now, now I just do it for them or they're mucking up things on their phone. So you can ask them to demonstrate that in your room by doing this. So Steph, I'll do you first. So um, can you be, you can be the normal person again. So can you demonstrate to me, Steph, how you would brush your teeth when you go home tonight? So keep going, Steph. So you can see there she's demonstrated um, the toothpaste and she's demonstrated using a tool and not even spitting out. <coughs> so that's very good. And then, Beck, yeah, we've got you. Okay. So could you, as a person living with dementia, could you demonstrate to me how to use a toothbrush? Um. Yeah. So what have you done there? What's, what's, what are the signs that you've demonstrated there, Beck? Well, I think that I might have a general gist, but I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the context is, is gone and there's, uh, yeah, I think some difficulties with that planning and progression really. Yeah, that's right. So there's no, there's no moving from one task to another, no detail in pulling out the toothpaste. Mm. No, there's not even no detail about holding a tool. It's just it's just kind of like this mm -hmm. kind of thing. And you can ask them to brush hair too, um, which is, I won't demonstrate that, but it's another, you know, like, you know, um, um, they might just sort of go like this as opposed to, you know, nicely brushing their hair. I had my hair cut today, so I need to brush my hair. But, you know, um, whatever the um, – uh, so it, it, you're trying to demonstrate this lack of ability to, to use a tool um, you can do things like too, where you have your hand on the on the chair and you get them to sort of, you know, do repetitive motions too. That's another one you can do the the dyskinesia. So yeah, that's that's the inclusion and criteria the for you. And the drawing test is another demonstration of dyspraxia as well. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So um, strictly speaking, I've been thinking about this. I think the clock drawing test is probably it. Uh, it includes a whole lot of stuff, and so um, I do the clock drawing test a lot but it's kind of like a mini sort of cognitive assessment tool that you can do in like 10 seconds <laughs> if you're really short of time <laughs> and mm -hmm. you can't even do a GP log, which is about five minutes, you know. But yeah, that, that's right. That will bring out some evidence of planning and you know, motor skills, being able to use a pen um, and ordering too, you know, putting the numbers right in the clock and then putting the time in the clock too. Thanks, All right, Steph. so that's the inclusion criteria, which is basically a distillation of the DSM-5, so a shorthand version of that. So, Beck, um, can you run through the exclusion criteria for us? Sure. So, um, essentially, we're now trying to make sure that we're not missing anything else. So, the exclusion criteria include delirium, other organic causes as well as psychiatric illness. So we've probably all seen delirium. Delirium can occur in people who are living with dementia, um, but delirium is an acute um, onset of confusion. It's characterized by a fluctuating course. So um, some, some, so you'll notice that over the course of um, minutes to hours to days, um, the cognition will fluctuate, as will alertness. Um, uh, people uh, with the delirium are quite inattentive and easily distracted. Um, and you can get different forms of delirium. Essentially, you can have a hypoactive delirium in which the um, person is quite sleepy. Um, you can have the hyperactive delirium, which, um, you know, as residents in the hospital, we were all getting called for code blacks. And that's generally this sort of very agitated, emotionally labile, um, shouting, etc. state. And then you can have a mixed delirium where it fluctuates from hypo to hyperactive. I suspect the hypoactive is probably the one that perhaps is a little bit more concerning because this is sometimes the one that we miss. And certainly in the nursing homes, it's the, it's the lady in the corner having a nap that 
might get missed um, as a delirium because delirium should be considered as an emergency. Delirium essentially signals that the brain is failing and it's really important that we try and discern the cause of the delirium. It's a talk for another day, but certainly looking for causes like infection, um, medications, um, constipation, dehydration um, are, are very important. Um, and this moves on to the other organic causes, which we need to um, exclude before we make any diagnosis of dementia. So looking at uh, endocrine, metabolic causes, vascular causes, um, medications, and that includes alcohol and also alcohol withdrawal, um, looking at the anticholinergic burden in somebody's medication is quite important. Um, and we'll talk later about investigations, but essentially investigations are trying to exclude the delirium and other organic causes. I had a patient not long ago who had a subdural hematoma. Um, I had a lady quite recently with quite a low sodium. Um, uh, just trying to think recently and, and some medication issues as well recently, which once we addressed, um, actually the cognition returned to normal. And then psychiatric illness is an important consideration. Um, we all have learned that, you know, people who are experiencing a depression might have a reduction in their concentration and in their memory and attention. And so it's really important um, that you do a um, mental health assessment, particularly there is a geriatric depression scale that you can use. Other psychiatric illnesses would include anxiety. And I think it's also very tricky for those patients who have a history of a psychosis like a schizophrenia or a bipolar disorder and then sometimes it's rather difficult to discern whether this is um, an aggravation or um, you know a, a recurrence of a previous um, mental health condition or a new diagnosis of dementia or both and I, I would I would suggest that that's the type of patient that you would want to refer for a second opinion. Mm. Um, but, but I think that excludes it. Sorry, yeah. go on. As I say, the bottom line is that you can have any of these things and still have a diagnosis of dementia, and that um, yeah. what you would do is treat them or identify the issues, correct them if possible, and then review um, the person to see them again. Because particularly with delirium, it's almost like a red flag. Um, for dementia because mm. it suggests that you've got low cognitive reserve and so those people may well have something that hasn't been detected in the past so yeah anything. thanks Steph that's right I think yeah they should always have a review if somebody comes in with a delirium we should be reassessing them in three months um, so when they've hopefully returned to their baseline um, to assess their their cognition because um, uh, people living with dementia are more likely to develop a delirium and also people with the delirium are more likely to develop a dementia. And, and as you said too, and we keep reiterating, it's all about review. So um, there has to be shown to be a, a progression to things and that requires regular review. Yeah, perfect. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next slide now which is introducing our case study. So we're gonna try and ex show you or demonstrate the inclusion criteria through the use of this case study. And so for educational purposes, it is quite simplified. You know, We're not all gonna get a 75 year old lady who is only on one single medication. Um, but um, so think of it in terms of that, um, just using it as an educational tool. But Sophie is a 75 year old lady. She lives on her own and she's come today with her daughter um i mean anna is a 75 year old lady and she's come with her daughter sophie um and so when someone comes with their um you know relative or someone else is there coming to the consult that doesn't normally attend that should also be obviously a you know a, something that raises your awareness that there's something else to be discussed and certainly that's what i would be thinking and i always think you know i'm gonna have to make a little bit extra time because that person might not come back again you want to use the opportunity so i sometimes run late as a result of these consults but yeah. 
to do that, I'm sure. Okay, so next slide, please, is going to be a video, hopefully. And whilst we watch the video, I want everybody to have a little think, what inclusion criteria have you seen demonstrated during the video? And what techniques did the doctor use that you thought were um, perhaps something you might use your, yourself in clinical practice? And what things did you think you perhaps might not use? Um, so if we could play the video. Hopefully it's going to work. And if we stop it at the point where... Um, Hello. Hi, it's good to see you. Yeah. How's things been going? Look, I've come about the flu injection. I think I'm a bit late, am I? You are a little bit late, actually. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, I was wondering, did, um, we sent out some reminders. I thought maybe you didn't get the reminder for the flu. I, I can't remember getting one, no. Yeah, well, that's great that you've, you've come along yeah, today. Yeah. I haven't seen you for a little while. How have things been going? Ah, uh, cutting back a little bit. You know, my garden was fairly big and I'm just sort of downsizing a bit on that because although I still love it, mm -hmm. it was getting a bit much for me, so I'm cutting back on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I just had a look through your file uh, before you came in and noticed that your blood pressure medication were due a little while ago. Oh. Have you still been taking... Uh, Tablets um, for blood pressure? Um, I, I think so. Yeah. You, you take them in the evenings, Mark. Oh, do I? Yes. Right, yes, okay. But I've run out, have I? Well, the prescription looks like it, you should have run out a little while ago if you'd been taking them regularly. Oh, right. Perhaps I miss some sometimes. I'm mm. not sure. Mm. Well, it certainly it can, it can be hard to remember, and there are things that we can talk about that might make that easier for you. Right, okay. Was there anything else that you were concerned about at this stage? Um, well, we just have a, had a little bit of a worry with memory, with the memory loss, like forgetting to take the pills, which we've just heard now. Uh, there's been a few incidences of leaving the stove on um, overnight, not realising that you'd turned the, turned the stove on. I don't remember that. No, I know, and that's, that's the thing. There's been a couple of things that, you know, that you don't remember yet. I don't know if that's normal at this stage, you know, at age, but you know, I just thought it might be worth a, um, check. a, che a check on some check. of those things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In a moment, I'll take you around to see our nurse and she can give you the flu needle because that's the main reason why yes. you've, you've come today. Yes. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll ask Jane to also check your blood pressure and weight, like usual, mm -hmm. just to make sure that everything's going along okay. Right. One of the other things I'd like to ask Jane Phoebe, to do you with you while the video you're there is to do a real simple... Thank you. We'll go back to the presentation, if that's all right. Sure. Hopefully everyone could hear that. I did see a message that somebody couldn't hear. Um, but hopefully you could all hear. Fully free. Um, yeah. Pardon? Fully free. Yeah. So, um, so obviously it's difficult for your participants to kind of explain what they saw in, in terms of the inclusion criteria. So I'm going to use Pete and Beck for this. So Pete, what did you see in terms of the inclusion criteria in that little short vignette? Uh, well, we actually saw quite a lot. So um, there was a demonstration of um, memory, so forgetting to um, take a medication and think I repeats up. Um, we didn't quite see it at the start, but she missed a recall for her um, flu vaccination. Um, and um, she was also, there was also a change in her function, so that needs to be explored further. So she um, wasn't gardening and looking after a garden as much which could be a whole lot of reasons, but, um, um, you know, the, the early stages of Alzheimer's may be one of them. Um, and also, um, uh, now I'm having memory loss. What was the, the, sex, the last one we talked about with her? <laughs> I can't remember now. Oh. She's leaving the stove on. Did oh, you mention the that? Stove on, that's right. Yeah, she left the stove on. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, which is a little bit more common and, and sort of like a um, uh, um, classic example. Mm. Yeah. So I don't think that anybody could actually hear the video. It looks like people had trouble with the sound. So for the benefit, of, for the benefit of everybody um, who didn't hear the video, um, the purpose of that um, 
consultation was to demonstrate how actually with some open questions um, keeping Anna central to the process, asking her some open questions, you can detect the body language of the other person that's in the room and sense that something else is going on and then ask permission from Anna, who's the patient, if it's okay to get a, a collateral history from her daughter. And the important thing is recognising that it's really important to get that consent um, to get that secondary information and, and the importance of actually getting that collateral history because the hardest thing in the world is to try and make a diagnosis of dementia without that collateral history wouldn't you agree i think like you mm. need to get some other information mm. from somebody else unless it's really really obvious you need to know you need some sense of timeline and you need some sense of how things have changed and really that comes from an external um perspective most of the time mm. I think people could, I think there was maybe one person in the chat box, so hopefully everyone else would hear the video. Um, oh, good, hopefully. I'm guessing so. But I think I agree with you there, and, and I think um, for those who could, who could hear the video, that was sort of a classic example. So if you had Anna there by herself, you, you just wouldn't get that same sense of what's going on, or the same sense of concern and worry about the changes. And that, that's another interesting part of dementia, is that some people have the insight and they're worried about it, and some people don't have the insight and they're just completely oblivious to the concerns <laughs> of everyone around them. And then, then you really do need the, the, uh, the collateral history because you just wouldn't get a history from them. They'd just say, yeah, everything's fine. But often you can also see there subtly that her the, the, the um, her speech was also, it um, just wasn't much detail as opposed to her daughter. Yeah, and we often refer to that as kind of empty talk. So the concept that people are saying a lot, but not a lot of detail is in there. And also, I think it's important once you've watched that video a few times, like I have, you can tell that when when Hilton asked the question or Dr. George asked the question, you know, how have things been going? Her response was kind of didn't really make sense to the uh, to the question. So she said, oh, I've been cutting back on my garden, you know, and it was a kind of didn't didn't relate particularly to how he had asked the question um and also um you know he he had t made sure that he took care of looking at the record before she came in he was aware that she'd missed her medications so just being prepared for those consultations also and using other information around the medical record can be helpful um all right so we'll move on to the next slide um so i think we've We've done this. Was there anything he did well, Beck? What did you think he did well? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, I thought he was very inclusive. I, I do think that, um, am I? No, you're not now. You no, you just went a bit quiet too. No, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think the way that um, he approached things was very inclusive. Um, I think he sensed that, um, uh, Sophie wanted to to talk a bit more as well, and I do think, as you said, him having prepared and um, prepared by having a look and seeing what scripts were required, etc., was quite good. And I think just giving the sense that we've got time to talk about this. I know we're busy, we're very busy, and it's sometimes hard, but these are the ones that you've just got to just slow it down a little bit, just in this initial consult, just to get the bones first. Yeah. All right, so we'll move on to the next slide. Um, and the next one. And the next one, because we've done all this, but this would be if we were able to communicate with the participants, which is a little bit tricky. So um, five, five things you would do as part of your examination. Um, what would be the top five things you would do, Pete? Good question, Steph. Number one, uh, so well, if you include um, some sort of cognitive assessment tool as part of your examination, if I was in an OSCE station, I'd probably be allowed to say that in my exams. Are there any registrars watching? I would do that, but let's just say we'll exclude that for now. So I would do weight would be my number one because weight just tells you so many things about someone's function, their you know um, their ability to shop, to cook, to remember to eat, to have an appetite, to absorb food. It tells you you know just a heap of stuff. Um, I'd do a blood pressure 
as part of their cardiovascular risk assessment, which is associated with vascular dementia and Alzheimer's dementia, um, I would do uh, think about doing urine analysis about any urinary symptoms just to exclude uh, UTI as part of what's potentially going on. Um, and what else would I do? And if they and I would consider also doing some sort of focused neurological examination depending on what they presented with, you know, so mm -hmm. if they were um, unbalanced or if they had, you know, visual loss or if they had, um, you know, like a, a hemipresis, obviously you'd be examined for that. Great. And if we flick onto the next slide, I think you've covered them all. Yep. Temperature, I think was the only one you didn't say. And oh, maybe any... Pulse, yes, good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next slide. So oh, the ECG, the ECG is because um, if you are going to consider starting some of the medications like denepazil, then getting an ECG is a good base. Helpful, and also yeah. it helps exclude things like AF, which is a risk factor for stroke. Correct, yeah. So Beck, do you want to run us through briefly this slide and what it's talking about in terms of the cognitive assessment tools? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there are a million. Oh, frozen. of different cognitive assessment tools that you can use and I think sorry can is that better yeah I don't know there's some there's a myriad about this um this area at the moment um yeah looking out of different tools that you oh, you've gone again oh. I'll just I'll I'll just I'll fill in for Beck. So there's several different um, cognitive assessment tools, and the bottom line is that you may need to adapt the one that you use depending on the person sitting in front of you. So for example, if you have someone of non-English speaking background and you're doing, trying to do a cognitive assessment tool, perhaps a mini mentor isn't the best one to use because um, that certainly has some disadvantages for people who don't speak English. So you might use the RUDAS. And the RUDAS is something that was developed in Australia, and you can use it with an interpreter. Um, it's quite a conversational cognitive assessment tool, so it's also less, less of a test, I think. Um, so for people who are feeling particularly anxious, it might be a useful one to do. And it's certainly worth having a look at if you have never had a look at it before. Then you have the Kika, which is um, has some evidence for using in indigenous populations, and there's both the re remote and urban version, as well as a Torres Strait Islander version, and that basically is differences in terms of the pictures and the things that you're identifying within um, within the assessment, so it's specific for that population. So you're trying to remove any disadvantage that you might get from using one of the other tools. And remembering that people in the indigenous population are actually far greater risk of developing dementia at a far earlier age. So really you're thinking about from age 55 for, um, for that population. And so it's really important that we actually are proactive in, in looking at people's cognitive health when they're from the indigenous um, populations. From, then from we have the GP COG. Sorry? Sorry, from 50 actually. 50, yeah. So um, GP COG is also Australian designed um, and it's a five minute, five minute assessment. So it's designed for a primary care um, consultation. And if you haven't used that one, it's worth having a look. It's an online tool and it talks you through everything. It includes the clock face, the three item recall, and it also prompts you to do the investigations and the collateral history as well. And um, the mocker which there is some training to do in order to use it but if you're a health professional you can gain free access to that training um, and um, I find that the mocker is also a good one to use but I think people get in fact I had a lady last week she said I was going to practice this test before I came in so people do are familiar with the mini mental and they will um, have a go at practicing it and um, want to get a good score people who score highly um, it may be because they don't have dementia, but it may be because they have a very high educational background and so they've managed to get a good score because of that. Likewise, people who score poorly, it might be because they have dementia, but it might be because they have um, you know, something that's affecting their ability to perform well on the test. So it could be anxiety or it could be um, because they have a, a low educational attainment. 
and so they have their limitations i think they're used in my practice i use them as an objective assessment so the history is the most important thing and then i'm doing these to kind of um reassure myself that what i found in the history matches the cognitive assessment tool so it's just like another another background check if you like but if they don't match up definitely you want to get a second opinion from someone all right so we'll move on to the next slide sorry so i filled in can i yeah. just reiterate that can you hear me now yes can you hear me yeah, oh, super. Yeah, look, um, and I, I do think you're quite right. I think we've very much focused today on Alzheimer's disease, which is classically um, a mem generally about 85% of the time it starts with this short term memory loss. But, but there is a proportion of people with Alzheimer's disease that start with different cognitive domains like language or something affected. And then other forms of dementia can start with different areas being affected. And so if somebody does score well on a cognitive test, if they have a relative with them or if they have their own subjective concerns, then I think that's that's sufficient reason to investigate further. Just that's correct, put my two yeah. cents worth in there. No, it's so important to take people's concerns seriously, I think, and not and not pass it off as mm -hmm. um, normal if that person definitely, yeah. All right, so investigations. I think this is the thing that we're all most confident with because most people will do this before they refer someone on to a geriatrician. Um, but the investigations broadly are looking for those exclusion criteria. So, Pete, five investigations, quick fire because we haven't got long left. Five investigations. So, um, you want to get some imaging of the brain, and a CT brain is acceptable. You don't need to get an MRI. Um, if you can, it's probably, you know, it may offer you a little bit more information, but um, it's not essential, so your brain is fine. Um, I would do um, my normal set of metabolic blood testing, um, you know, full blood count, ELFTs. I'd do a thyroid function um, and a B12 and a folate um, and make sure they don't have diabetes and a calcium. Those are the ones I'd be, they're my, my mainstays. Yeah. Good. So if we move on to the next slide, there and are add, some, yeah, routine and then there's some additional. Add the, add the other ones in as you feel, feel, feel appropriate. So depending on the population sitting in front of you and what you want. Yeah, or the presentation. Yeah. All right. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, Anna and Sophie, so we do have a video. In fact, if you didn't watch the videos, we'll perhaps send you uh, clips of the videos. Um, so you can also watch the collateral history because you do get a lot more information from the collateral history. But Anna and Sophie returned for review and Anna's examination was normal for her age. Her blood tests and her CT brain were also normal for age. Her mini mental score was 23. She did have some dysphasia and agnosia and her geriatric depression score was normal. So what do we think the diagnosis might be? Yes, Pete. Alzheimer's <laughs> dementia. Alzheimer's dementia. Yes, most likely because it's the most common, and we've excluded all our exclusion criteria, and we've included all our inclusion criteria. And so, uh, if we move on to the next slide, she had memory that was getting worse over time. She was increasingly forgetful. She was having problems with her gardening, cooking, and socialising. And she had that cortical dysfunction. So if we move on to the next slide, we've excluded the delirium by checking her bloods and her temperature and her urine and doing all those tests and also doing a geriatric depression scale. We move on to the next slide. So hopefully you all feel at least somewhat confident that this is Alzheimer's. Hopefully we've convinced you it's you can be somewhat confident, if not very confident, um, and also giving you a pathway or at least a framework with which to approach the next person that you see who has concerns about their memory and thinking. I always talk about memory and thinking because that helps me remember that it's more than just memory. It's memory and thinking. All right, so if you move on to the next slide. That brings me neatly onto beginning with the end in mind. So dementia is more than a memory problem. 
I think we've hopefully managed to um, hopefully managed to explain that. We've also talked about the cognitive assessment tools, and you notice we don't call them screening tools because I don't feel they really do any screening, but they can be useful to aid your assessment. And next time we'll start talking about post-diagnostic care and actually how do you deliver. In fact, the next time we'll come back and start with delivery of the diagnosis, because actually I think that's also one of the things that we find the hardest as, as doctors generally is giving that diagnosis. But as Pete said, it can actually be a gift for some people because it actually empowers people. And I think we need to start thinking about empowering the person in front of us. All right, right. there are a couple of other slides, yeah? I was going to say that's right, and there's lots of meaningful, um, important things you can do in terms of um, care, and um, you know, with the person um, that doesn't involve medication. That's right. Yeah. So we have some resources which are on the next couple of slides. So we do have a dementia resource hub, which is a web page for general practitioners on the DTA website, um, which you can download some other resources and look at our podcast which is on the next slide um, we do have this podcast called Dementia in Practice which talks about lots of really interesting stuff uh, gets the perspective of people with lived experience carers um, talks about all different aspects of what it's like looking after people with dementia or, or people's experience of dementia and um, so if you want to have a listen to that you're very welcome and um, Health Pathways you have a Health Pathways and an excellent clinical editor who's somewhere in the background um who might might show her face i'm, I'm here hello <laughs> so, uh, it's funny you should mention all those resources because they're all on health pathways is this where you would right. like me to show my screen and where they all are this um firstly thank you for that amazing presentation thank you so much can you all see a login slide for hunter new england community health pathways so you are all welcome to qr code um and that's the login username and password uh, and you are welcome to have a little look around the site while we're talking but that was just um an amazing um tour through the cognitive impairment and dementia pathway thank you um, and one of their colleagues Hilton Coppy who is a clinical editor for the Mid North Coast Community Health Pathway has developed a fantastic pathway for all the communities to use and we have used that as a template for ours um, there are two ways to find it you can put dementia up in the search bar up the top or you can go down the side to older person's health they'll both get you there um, but let's just click on it because I realize that it is already 802 but um, I just wanted to point out that there are so many things um, in here that um, were mentioned tonight. I did <laughs> earlier this week change um, cognitive screening tests to um, um, cognitive assessment tools down here, but I forgot to do it up in the practice point. So I will change, I've already put a request in to change that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, the, these people have talked very much about getting um, the history from the family and the carer, so that's up there. All the five domains are on there. I don't know, Peter, what's on the resource you're going to hand out, but um, these have got all the the five domains that you talked about tonight in that assessment. Um, um, the, re the resource is basically they're the sh they're, um, you can copy. There'll be a word document. You can copy and paste the text and make a shortcut in your best practice software or your medical director software, whatever you're using. So you can bring up domains, you can bring okay. up investigations and those kind of things. Is it worth, it might be worth adding to the health pathway because we do put um, templates on pathways sometimes so that people can um, download it. Mm. So that's that's an idea. Um, the, the physical examination is exactly what you said. We've got um, a specific pathway for the focused neurological examination. Um, routine investigations, all the ones that you outlined, um, all the cognitive assessment tools that you mentioned are there. Um, all the additional investigations when you might consider to do a, a CT scan, um, some ideas around the differential diagnosis for delirium and dementia and depression. Um, and if you are looking for the geriatric depression scale, that will be on the depression in older people's page. And I just want to show you a really cool thing. If you're looking for something on a health pathway and you can't find it, click the expand all button. And let's just say you're looking for the geriatric depression scale, um, press F, Control F and do that, and then you just flick through and you'll find where it is in the pathway. So that's a neat tool. 
that I use a lot because I can, even though I write the pathways, I often can't find what I've written. <laughs> so just a little tip from me to you. Um, and then uh, the for exclusion and three inclusion criteria and the types of dementia. So I think that's where we got to tonight. Um, and the rest, yes, and next we'll time we meet. Part two. Yeah. yeah, when we meet in two weeks time, Lee Fong will be here and he will show you through the rest of the pathway. And I believe he's listening tonight. I've seen his name. And just also to let you know, down the bottom in the four health professionals, we've got that Dementia in Practice podcast series. We've got all the um, resources from these guys down there as well. And of course, we've always got the four patients information there. So please have a look around Health Pathways. If you've got any feedback, send us the feedback because we can only make these pathways as good as, um, as we hear from our audience. So please let us know what you think. Excellent. Thank you, Sandra. It's all right. I'll stop sharing so that... Um, <laughs> and oh, Hilton was, it the for guest, me? Um, was the guest star doctor in that little video. So... Yes, Anyone he was. Forward. Yeah, we're very lucky to have Hilton. I'll just leave that up in case people miss that. Okay, well, we're five minutes over. If anyone has a question, I, we are totally happy to stay, but you are also very welcome to finish. There are no <laughs> questions in the box. I'm assuming there was no right. question. No. Um, I'd just like to say a huge shout out to our presenters, Steph, Pate, and Back, really, really interesting, really engaging, um, which I can understand can be difficult on a platform like this. Um, we, and I just wanted to say thank you to our audience for spending their evenings with us. Um, because this does cut into home time, lifetime, family time, dinner time, and on a really bad day, extra work time. Um, so we do appreciate the time that you spend with <laughs> us. Bedtime, that's right. Um, yeah, other than that, thank you. Um, and, and I want to encourage everyone to come back in two weeks. Yes, two weeks. Don't miss it. No, everyone, we just encourage everyone to come back in two weeks on the 6th of September for part two with these guys, because I think it'll be just as fantastic as tonight's been. <laughs> thank you. See Thanks. you then. Bye. Thanks so Thank much, you. everyone. Good night. See you.